My name is Jennifer Ponce de Leon. Um, I'm an associate professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania and a co-director of the Critical Theory Workshop. And I'm really pleased to um, be speaking today with Nazia Kazi. Nazia is a, uh, an associate professor of anthropology at Stockton University. She's the author of Islamophobia, Race, and Global Politics, which recently came out in an updated and expanded edition. And I would really encourage everybody to get their copy of this book. Um, and Nazia is also currently working on a new book project, which is about the CIA's involvement in Muslim majority countries. So thank you so much, Nazia, for doing this interview. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. It's great to be in conversation with you. So I wanted to start out um, by asking you, you uh, recently wrote an article uh, for Middle East Eye titled How the War on Terror Obscures America's Alliance with Right-Wing Islam. And in this article, you write about ways the U.S. military has used Islam to advance its policy objectives. And you show that the U.S. government has not only promoted Islamophobia through its policies, um, at other times it has also allied with right-wing Muslim forces in anti-communist campaigns. So could you please talk about this history and tell us what we should learn from it in order to better understand the U.S. military's manipulation of religion and culture, the U.S.'s proxy wars, and, its strategic affinity, and the strategic affinities that exist between the U.S. ruling class and fundamentalist regimes and forces in other parts of the world? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I think since the events of September 11, 2001 and the ensuing war on terror, there's been this uh, really burgeoning language of Islamophobia that has become enshrined in American racial discourse. And all too often, the framing of Islamophobia assumes a kind of global assault on Muslims led by the West. Um, and if you look around the world, you certainly can see evidence of that, whether you're looking at the sort of ethno-nationalist anti-Muslim surge in India under Narendra Modi, or you're looking at, you know, the post 9-11 anti-Muslim hysteria that really swept the United States. But what I want to argue, and I think what you're pointing at in your question, is that to frame Islamophobia that way, in a way that frames it as simply anti-Muslim hostility, misses some really important historical context. And I'll start with just a quick example. Um, when I was doing my ethnographic research with Muslim American organizations, I found time and again this refrain that would come up in Muslim representational spaces and spaces where people are trying to argue, you know, for the diversity and inclusion of Muslims trying to speak out against Islamophobia. I heard this refrain, um, Indonesia is the world's most populous Muslim country. And anytime I give a talk, I'll, I'll ask the audience, you know, what's the world's most populous Muslim country? And many people will shout out Indonesia. It's a well-known fact. But what is not often known in these Muslim representational spaces is this very history that you're pointing at of US involvement in Indonesia. And um, just by way of historical context, the independence from, um, from the Dutch was followed by a really remarkable exuberance across Indonesia. Um, there was a rise in the standard of living. There were really powerful trade unions and labor unions that formed. The uh, standard of living for women uh, drastically improved. And again, this was in a uh, majority Muslim country and many elements of the left and many elements of the progressive um, movements in Indonesia were observant practicing Muslims. But of course, um, this posed a real threat to US national security interests at the time. And at the time, the CIA was sort of a nascent organization and was already engaging in its covert activities around the world. And in the case of Indonesia, this meant for the US a real vested interest in toppling these progressive movements. And one of the ways that was done was through direct sponsorship of the right-wing Muslim observant forces. And I think this is really an object lesson for how we understand American Islamophobia, because I think what happened was through, you know, US involvement in Indonesia, these progressive, these leftist, these communist currents were squashed and the political ambitions of this Muslim majority country were squashed. And this was done with a strategic partnership with the right-wing Muslim elements in Indonesia. 
And of course, what followed is well known under Suharto, the sort of reign of terror that saw a literal genocide of people and the opening up of Indonesian markets for uh, American sweatshops. Uh, this is an important history, and it looks at not just anti-Muslim sentiment, but it looks at the material basis of it, you know. Um, I think one thing that's often missing from popular conversations about uh, U.S. foreign policy and the alliances it keeps are the very terms left and right. I mean, all too often you'll hear people talk about, you know, uh, whether a regime is authoritarian or not, um, whether a regime is theocratic or not. But what's missing from that is a focus on, you know, the economic commitments of a particular state. And, you know, I think that's really crucial here. A lot of civil libertarians, a lot of American liberals will get, you know, really worked up about, for instance, the U.S.'s cozy alliance with Saudi Arabia, a kingdom that is itself a creation of the United States. Um, particularly because of its repression of women, its repression of social movements, its repression of workers. You'll hear that less often. Um, but what is missing is that this isn't just an alliance with a fundamentalist Muslim regime in the Middle East. It's a right-wing regime. And that needs to be really central to our understanding of that alliance itself. So, you know, I mean, Indonesia is one example. And when you look at the US involvement in Indonesia, at times it's very cartoonish. For instance, the CIA created a fake pornographic film starring a body double of uh, Sukarno, who was the, the Indonesian leader that the US was attempting to overthrow in an attempt to appeal to Muslim sexual conservatism. They, they thought that leaking this tape would help overthrow him. So religion, or at least the CIA's conception of Muslim practice was sort of the raw material for that, um, for that program. So we could look at Saudi Arabia, we could look at Indonesia, we could look at most notoriously perhaps um, the alliance between the US and the right-wing Afghan Mujahideen during the Cold War years and see a very similar story there. And this one would of course uh, come back to bite the US um, in one of the most sensational acts of blowback, of course, the September 11th attacks. So I think, you know, and we'll, I'm sure, talk about this more, I think our conception of Islamophobia really needs to understand um, the systemic commitments of the U.S. national security state and its, its um, you know, its, it, it, its alliances having a material purpose, you know, sort of if you follow the money, it starts to make a lot more sense. The alliance with the Saudi royal family seems less like this garish anomaly uh, when you look at, you know, the project of building U.S. military bases or the project of maintaining access to um, easily flowing um, fossil fuels. No, thank you so much for that. Um, now, it seems that the history of U.S. alignments with anti-communist um, Islamic forces that you've been addressing um, clearly contradicts sort of culturalist pseudo explanations of political conflicts that are regularly promoted by the US propaganda apparatus and academic ideologues. And I'm thinking here of the various kind of versions of the clash of civilizations argument, which basically casts political conflicts in terms of civilizational or cultural difference. Um, you have a very powerful critique of culturalism or culture talk um, in your book. Could you talk about the problems with this type of approach, not only when it's used to demonize Muslims, but also when it's used for pur purportedly more benevolent or humanizing ends? Sure. And this um, term culture talk we get from Mahmoud Mamdani's really foundational book, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, The US, The Cold War, and The Roots of Terror, a book that I think should be circulated more in Islamophobia studies circles and um, public discourse on Islamophobia. Um, when we're talking about culture talk, and I observed this when I was doing my ethnographic fieldwork with Muslim American organizations, quite often the response to Islamophobia that came out of these organizations was focused on sort of explaining Muslim culture to the West. That's why you see uh, hijab solidarity days, you see interfaith panels, you see come visit a mosque kind of outreach days, as if that will somehow solve the problem of anti-Muslim racism. Now, we have to think though about not just the efficacy of such programs, but really you know, what they serve, what ends they serve. These kind of 
really defensive attempts to explain um, anti-Muslim race, uh, to explain both anti-Muslim racism and the nature of Islam itself and Muslim cultural diversity to the West, um, basically conceptualizes Islamophobia as an attitudinal project. In other words, Islamophobia is simply a matter of racial and religious intolerance. And of course, this can be said of all forms of race discourse in the US. It is typically understood in identitarian framings, in attitudinal framings. And as such, Islamophobia has sort of become essentialized, where again, it's seen as this sort of global anti-Muslim pogrom. And then the material, political, or economic context of Islamophobia is rendered incidental rather than sort of foundational, you know? So this notion that Islamophobia is rooted in identitarian impulses, in a misunderstanding of who Muslims are, or some kind of fundamental clash uh, between civilizations, um, misses the whole history of um, where Islamophobia was born to begin with. And of course, one of those would be the specific Cold War politics through which you know the US national security state restructured vast swaths of the world, including um, the Muslim world. So, you know, after September 11, 2001, we saw countless attempts of Muslims trying to explain Islam to the West. Um, and we also saw a lot of attempts by Muslims and by sort of anti-Islamophobia non-Muslim advocates to render Muslims legitimate by highlighting their compatibility with American capitalism. Um, so quite often the sort of good Muslim in American um, cultural discourse was someone who sort of eagerly supported the war on terror, who uh, stood you know, in solidarity with the FBI and CIA's post 9-11 anti-Muslim projects of surveillance and policing, who would often work and vocally speak about their work in uh, the American finance sector as uh, proof of their legitimacy in the United States. You know, and this is at a time when the very rules of war were being rewritten by the US to expand presidential authority. The very kinds of expansions of presidential authority that were used by Obama and Trump to decimate what we might call the Muslim world. You know, And so the dangers of rendering Islamophobia some kind of flat anti-Muslim hostility is, is that, is that you miss seeing um, those global politics. So I think kind of, you know, following up on that, when you've, you know, your very cogent answer as to why kind of these liberal understandings of racism and the kind of focus on identity and personal attitudes um, is really obfuscating the material conditions that produce racialized oppression and violence. So just as a kind of counterpoint to that, I mean, your work is really outlining a materialist approach to how we should think about Islamophobia, and I think also a materialist approach to thinking how we should think about racism more generally, um, and including and especially their its racism's relationship to colonialism and imperialism. So could, I just wanted to hear you talk a bit more about how we should think about these things, and also how a kind of materialist understanding of Islamophobia helps clarify our understandings of things that are often kind of just cast as anti-Muslim anti -Muslim racism. Yeah, so I'm reminded of, um, you know, this uh, controversy that exploded around an advertisement by Gap Apparel Company. And this was uh, about 10 years ago now when they featured a Sikh model in their ad. And of course, Sikhs in the US are often read as Muslim. In fact, the first hate crime murder following September 11, 2001 was actually of a Sikh person, not a Muslim. And so the billboard ads that featured this model were graffitied um, with anti-Muslim uh, slurs, you know, calling him a terrorist, telling him to go home, etc. cetera. Um, and what came after that was really interesting. It was Gap, the apparel company, uh, turning their homepage into that ad featuring the Sikh model and issuing statements saying they stand with Sikhs and Muslims around the world. And this is a really remarkable moment because it was at this precise time that Gap was catching some heat for their 
anti-worker practices in Bangladesh, a Muslim country, you know? And so we have to ask, you know, what's being whitewashed? And a lot of Muslims and Sikhs signed up to support GAP at that point. They celebrated this inclusive move. Um, and you find this all too often in anti-Islamophobia spaces in the US, a complete um, inability to talk about really the realities of capitalism. And, you know, uh, we know that there has to be a tripartite focus on capitalism, racism, and imperialism. They are three legs of a stool. I mean, asking what Islamophobia is without looking at the realities of capitalism is asking Mrs. Lincoln other than that assassination, how was the play, right? I mean, you simply can't do it, but there are these attempts that happen in um, anti-Islamophobia discourse that really um, attempt to ignore perhaps systemically the role of capital um, as foundational in Islamophobia, you know? And I really think it's worth thinking about just how fickle the relationship is between the, seat, the very seats of power and, of empire and um, Islamic practice and Muslim populations themselves, right? So I spoke earlier about these right-wing alliances with Muslim elements historically and contemporarily. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a switch that can be flipped in either way. So obviously after September 11, 2001, for instance, we can look at the New York Police Department's demographics unit, which was basically an anti-Muslim surveillance project that spied on Muslims. It actually used training from the CIA to develop this program um, and surveilled all elements of Muslim life. You know, what coffee shops people were hanging out at, what soap operas they were watching, etc. cetera. Um, it's very easy to look at the post 9-11 landscape and see elements of anti-Muslim racism, most notoriously in, for instance, the USA Patriot Act or the construction of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. But this ignores the fact, and this is why I think it's important to look at the history of alliances alongside the history of demonizations, that you know it was as early as 1949 that President Truman talked about using anti-communist Muslims in China, um, as uh, you know, as a, to sort of strategically use them as a way to um, issue a threat to the power of the Chinese state. Um, you know, uh, there was an article in Time magazine in 1979 during the Cold War that said uh, a zealous Quranic evangelism just might create problems for the Kremlin. The ways in which the U.S. strategically didn't just seek out, but really sponsored and enabled a kind of Islamism has to be key in our understanding of Islamophobia. Um, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski, a uh, notorious anti-communist, was asked in the interview, because he was the one who began uh, sending uh, weapons and funding to the Afghan Mujahideen. He was asked years later if he regretted supporting the very extremists who would be responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Uh, you know, he said, What's more important in world history, the Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet empire, some agitated Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? So these are really you know, important histories for us to pay attention to. Um, it was in 1953 when the US overthrew the Iranian government that the CIA recruited right-wing uh, mullahs, uh, you know, religious figures to aid in that overthrow. Um, it was CIA director Bill Casey who believed that American Christians and Catholics should unite with world Muslims, the world's Muslim population against the communist threat, right? Um, so this is really important to pay attention to. Uh, Vijay Prashad has called this the opportunistic use of religion. So it's not just that Islam is sort of the backdrop to the US's foreign policy and domestic policy machinations, it's, it's the raw material of it. And for our framings of Islamophobia, it would serve us really well to, to remember that. No, thank you so much. And for the, you know, pointing to these really important historical facts that um, are oftentimes not acknowledged in the kind of narratives that we, uh, we receive. Um, well, I, you've written about and also given some interviews about uh, uh, the war on terror and also 
the um, some the understandings of it, popular understandings of it. I, I think probably for both you and I, the initiation of the you know so-called war on terror was a pretty formative experience and a kind of education, not only in U.S. imperialism but in the important role of propaganda in it. Um, and in some of your writings and interviews, you've reflect on you've reflected on what you have learned, particularly from talking to your students, um, about how the history of the so-called war on terror has been represented, or more perhaps often buried in the last two decades. Um, so I wanted to ask you a two-part question about this, and you can take either part, and you know, take it in whatever order. One part is. Um, what do you think are the most important things that people should know about the war on terror, and particularly to help us better understand contemporary global class struggle and the role of U.S. imperialism in it? And secondly, how should we think about the ruling class's propaganda efforts in regard to this history and perhaps in the war on terror itself? Yeah, great question. And, you know, this question and my research on it really comes out of something I noticed after, you know, over a decade of teaching about the war on terror in American college classrooms, especially as I saw more and more students coming into the classroom who were like too young to actually remember the events, you know, the way we remember and people mm -hmm. of our generation and older than us, it's become this sort of flashpoint, kind of like the Kennedy assassination. Where were you when 9-11 happened? Now, as a Muslim, I can tell you, you know, there's a second question we asked, which was, who did this and are we in big trouble? Like Muslim Americans, and this was backed up in my field work, we immediately understood that there would be a sort of collective blame doled out to Muslims in the US as a result of these attacks. And that's precisely what happened. You know, um, the response to September 11th domestically in the US was a wholesale rounding up of Muslim migrants. And let's be clear, these were working class Muslim migrants. Um, the sort of professional elite Muslim immigrants in the US were largely spared. Um, the most brutal elements of the domestic war on terror. And that's an important thing to remember. The sort of class dimensions of how Islamophobia and the reactions to 9-11 played out in the US is really important. Um, I think it's also important to remember, and this is um, often missing from many conversations about September 11th and the war on terror, are the economic dimensions of it. I mean, the immediate aftermath of September 11th, 2001, saw Bush, George Bush, go from one of the least popular American presidents to pretty much overnight one of the most popular. His approval rating went through the roof. And there was this national climate of unity behind Bush and the ensuing war on terror that allowed for a lot of things to sort of fly under the radar that otherwise would not have. So tax cuts for the ultra rich right after September 11th, bailouts for airline executives right after September 11th, the expansion of offshore drilling for fossil fuel companies right after September 11th. And of course, we Americans, uh, many Americans were too scared of another terrorist attack. We were too busy being bombarded with those inane color-coded terror threats at airports and train stations um, that were clearly some kind of psychological ploy. Um, we were too busy taking off our shoes and putting our shampoo in small bottles at the airport to really notice. And this is how disaster capitalism works. This is why the ruling class says never, you know, let a good crisis go to waste. And September 11th sure as hell didn't go to waste for the ruling class in the U.S. Um, I also think another thing we ought to remember about the war on terror is that it was a bipartisan project. At least for me at the time, something that became very clear was liberal complicity in the politics of American empire building. And this became very clear with the eagerness of the both invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, but also just the wholesale expansion of um, the US security state. And when I say the security state, you know, I'm talking about the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. And we've also seen these kind of really perverse spillover effects. Um, so for instance, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security after September 11th, ostensibly to keep us safe from Muslim terrorists, has mostly been weaponized against um, you know, migrants from Latin America. 
We've seen the logic of counterterrorism used on Native American, on indigenous water protectors. Um, so we're not just talking about Muslims being caught in the post 9-11 hysteria that exists to this day. It's a vast project. Um, and so to your question about my, um, my study, about how it is that Americans understand or misunderstand um, the events of September 11th. Again, this study largely came out of some patterns I noticed through my pedagogy, which is that um, those who are too young to remember September 11th remember certain things very well. 2,997 is a number that my respondents knew very well, the number of Americans who died on September 11th. But when you ask them who was responsible for the attacks, a lot of them would say ISIS. Uh, which didn't exist yet, which was born in Iraq as a result of the U.S.'s 2003 invasion of Iraq based on lies. Um, a lot of them said Palestine was responsible for the 9-11 attacks, and a huge chunk of them, I'm talking 20 percent of my respondents, said Saddam Hussein was behind the September 11th attacks. So this is very interesting that my respondents knew just how many Americans died, and they also knew that the first responders suffered respiratory ail ailments that they didn't get compensation for, but didn't know anything about who was behind the attacks or about what followed. So for instance, a lot none of my respondents knew uh, what happened at Abu Ghraib, the really remarkable um, sexual torture scandals that were um, you know, horribly memorialized in the photographs that sort of I thought sort of became viral at the time, but they are not a part of our collective memory in the US. So there's a simultaneous forgetting of the devastation that followed September 11th and that came with the war on terror, but a really vivid remembering of American victimhood. And I think that is a key and sort of by design feature of, um, of this spirit of 912 about the, the climate that followed September 11th. And I think that would be a major takeaway as well, which is that we have to recognize that some of the disastrous decisions that were made um, after September 11, 2001, shouldn't be conceptualized as these like oops kind of moments that like, well, the Bush was a real oaf and he got us into a lot of trouble, um, you know, and, you know, Michael Parenti has written about sort of this idea of America as this bumbling empire, you know, this, this flawed idea of America as like, this giant that just messes up and makes mistakes and is careless. Um, and it couldn't be further from the truth, right? As Parenti reminds us, it couldn't be further from the truth that there are distinct calculations that are made both in foreign and domestic policy by the US. Um, I mean, it, you, we can look for instance at um, the 1980s and the Iran-Iraq war in which ostensibly Iraq was the US ally. I mean, for the longest time, Saddam Hussein was a US ally, but the US was also supporting covertly, um, Iran. And, and why would you support both sides in a major conflict? I mean, obviously, the kind of devastation and mass killing would create a kind of chaos that would serve the seats of empire. So it's not just that we made a huge mistake when we invaded Iraq. It's that it wasn't a mistake when you look at it from the seats, points of view of the seats of power. And I think that's a really key reminder for us to keep um, at, at the forefront while we look back at the war on terror. And would you say that as, you know, part of this, that these things that um, in terms of what really does serve the interests of the seats of empire would also be the kind of um, justification for the injection of more and more and more money into the military industrial complex? Um, yeah, you well. know. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen is a ballooning of the, not just the formal military budget, but also the, you know, um, expansion of the weapons industry. I just saw today, um, I believe this happened yesterday, but a professor at Harvard, uh, she is also on the board of Raytheon, and she was giving a lecture on climate change. Um, so like, just Think about that for a moment. I mean, I think the I think the U.S. military is the biggest polluter on planet Earth. Um, she is on the board of Raytheon, uh, one of the biggest war profiteers on planet Earth, and she's giving a lecture on climate change at the world's most prestigious university. And of course, she was heckled, and uh, a bunch of people interrupted her talk and read out the crimes carried out by Raytheon. 
um, which was a really remarkable moment, you know? And I think so what, I think when we think about American militarism and what you're pointing to about the expansion of American militarism, one, it's to remember that uh, militarism has this entropy, like the military budget will balloon, but it's very hard for it to shrink, you know? So the things that are named security threats, even when they stop being security threats, there will be resources and weaponry poured into those um, elements. That's really important. And I think it's also important to remember that militarism doesn't have a neat line drawn around it with the formal military complex, right? Because we're also talking about, I think like the new Top Gun movie that came out this summer was basically a State Department creation, as was the first Top Gun movie, as are many movies, movies that aren't even about war. Um, a lot of directors will turn to the Pentagon for funding because they can use really cool special effects um, or really cool state-of-the-art, you know, helicopters and aircrafts in their films if they let the Pentagon, or in many cases, the CIA, review their scripts and chime in on it. You know, even episodes of Cupcake Wars and Jeopardy and Ice Road Truckers have been vetted by the CIA or the Pentagon. Um, so militarism pops up in weird places in the U.S., um, you can go to a football game and see, you know, the Air Force showing off their new equipment at a, at a flyover over a stadium. The kinds of things where if the U.S. saw happening in a place like North Korea would be panic inducing because look at that militaristic culture. But it's like perfectly normalized and in many ways even invisibilized, sort of hiding in plain sight for us here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. No, like they made such a good point. And this one other thing, I um, just to follow up on what you had said, it seems that in the same way that you're saying that like military budgets can like will expand and expand but they aren't ever really pulled back that um it seems like that's also kind of what you were saying about the um expansion of the police state in the wake of it is part of the um war on terror and that you have the um you know, like something with Homeland Security then becoming like a primary form of terrorizing migrants or the kind of um, rolling back of um, civil liberties that just then becomes normalized or the spying on, you know, everybody all the time. Um, so I just didn't know if there's anything um, maybe else you, that you just thought in that regard about the ways that kind of the war on terror has also just so a lot of the kind of um, way it was used to expand the police state has just become kind of institutionalized, even though it was done, um, you know, ostensibly in these kind of emergency major measures is how it was, you know, kind of presented to the public. Yeah, I mean, the deputizing of local law enforcement to serve as counterterrorism forces should really send chills down all of our spine, right? I mean, I think this was most notable at some of the tactics that were used at Occupy Wall Street, right? That it was Islamophobia, apologies. <laughs> Somebody um, wants your attention. Yes, can I, can I just pause real quick? Yeah. Sorry for the, <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I mean, it was, like uh, counterterrorism tactics used at Standing Rock against water water protectors. It was um, counterterrorism tactics used in New York City against Occupy Wall Street protesters. Um, and let's be clear, the CIA's collaboration with local law enforcement is the embodiment of this kind of um, this kind of history that you're talking about. Um, so for instance, it's been revealed that one of the key techniques that the CIA has engaged in since the start of the war on terror is the construction of a vast archipelago of black sites, these sort of secret prisons around the world where people have been disappeared, detained, interrogated, tortured, sort of off the books. There's no paper trail for that, right? Um, and it was revealed uh, not long ago in the US that the Chicago Police Department was operating a black site in Chicago at Home and Square, um, which was literally modeled off the kind of black sites that the US um, builds abroad. Um, you know, in the many years that we have been talking about mass incarceration and the crisis of mass incarceration in the US, there's been a parallel carceral crisis unfolding because of the war on terror. So we're not just talking about, you know, um, Abu Ghraib prison or the detention center at Guantanamo Bay, which are the 
two most common, but the whole chain of um, carceral sites, black sites that have been integral to the war on terror. And we should think about those alongside our conversations about mass incarceration in the US, right? Because they follow similar patterns and they serve similar ends. Um, the same can be said about, you know, how we think about um, the, the issue of migration in the U.S. Um, the U.S. has decided now that climate change is a national security issue, which basically what that means is um, rather than actually working to fight climate change or build sort of climate resistant housing or those kinds of things, it actually means deploying more resources to the border to prevent climate migration. Um, the U.S. is doing that. Canada is doing that. Um, global North countries know that climate catastrophes will mean migration. And so uh, the, the approach to dealing with imminent climate catastrophe is to wall off our borders. Um, and none of this would really have been possible without the sort of the homeland security, um, creation of homeland security that followed September 11th. So what was easily pushed through this moment of sort of mass hysteria following 9-11, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which then subsumed what used to be INS, but then was ICE and Border Patrol, um, by sort of drawing on anti-Muslim sentiment, this fear of a terrorist attack, all kinds of expansions of anti-immigrant forces became possible in the US, right? So it was just, um, you know, earlier this year that we saw Border Patrol whipping Haitian migrants. I mean, this was, of course, under the Biden administration. Biden, the Biden administration has had a really horrible policy of mass deportation, just as the Obama administration did. And of course, in between that, we saw the horribly xenophobic Trump administration. Now, I think it's really interesting that around that time that Border Patrol was caught on camera whipping Haitian migrants, the Biden administration was considering revamping um, the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center into a detention center for Haitian asylum seekers. So again, this speaks to that question we had earlier about how, you know, when you create something, it's very hard to then shrink it. It's very hard to repurpose it. Instead, you just find ways to repurpose it. And that is very true of the carceral sites of the war on terror. Wow. Wow, that's, um... No, thank you so much for that. Um, well, I know we've been talking for a while. I was just going to ask you one kind of final question. You can just if there's anything you wanted to tell us about this new book that you're working on. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think it was really interesting when uh, Gina Haspel was up for nomination. She became the CIA director. But during the public discussions around her nomination, there was all of this debate about, you know, her involvement with torture. Um, with the Bush era torture program. And I thought that was kind of funny, not ha ha funny, but like scary funny, because in a weird way, when you begin to study the history of this agency, someone like Gina Haspel sort of seems like almost the perfect person to head it up. She sort of embodies the spirit of the CIA. And this is really interesting to think about today in one of the many eras of CIA's attempted rebranding efforts. So for instance, I just saw um, that Last week, the CIA unveiled a new statue at their Langley headquarters of Harriet Tubman. Um, we all remember last summer's woke CIA agent ad with a probably a Latinx uh, CIA agent who is neurodivergent and second generation and has all of the sort of trappings of identity politics. Um, Several months ago, I saw an op-ed written by a trans CIA agent celebrating the inclusivity of the agency. Um, and of course, in light of that, I think it's really interesting to think about the history of the agency and specifically for the purposes of my work, its position in the what we might call the Muslim world, in Muslim majority countries. Um, and I want to look in this book at this, the decades long rightening <laughs> of the Muslim world that was crafted by the CIA. You know, the ways in which, as we discussed Indonesia earlier, or perhaps Afghanistan, um, the ambitions of Muslim communists and Muslim leftists were systematically squashed. 
And for thinking about Islamophobia, I think it's really interesting because it forces us to ask a different question. Um, it forces us to ask this sort of what if question. In other words, what would the world, what might the world have looked like had the Muslim left been allowed to flourish on the path it was flourishing, right, throughout those years of the Cold War? And I think the answer is the world would look drastically different. And I think it, it's a very interesting question for us to ask. Well, that sounds um, like a book I am really looking forward to reading. So thank you so much, Nazia, for talking with me. And um, again, I just really want to encourage everybody to get Nazia's book, Islamophobia, Race and Global Politics. Um, thank you so much, Nazia. Thank you. Thanks so much.